All right, we're going to get started, everybody. Sit back and enjoy this wonderful presentation. Good morning and welcome to today's presentation. Elizabeth Lawrence, The Illumination of a Garden Writer. This program is a collaboration between Winghaven and Charlotte, North Carolina, and the Cherokee Garden Library in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Jill Goodrich, and I'm the Director of Education and Outreach at Winghaven in Charlotte. I'll be your moderator today. As a reminder, if you have any questions during the presentation, please go ahead and pop them into the Q&A feature of Zoom. Likewise, keep an eye on chat for some important links and other information that we'll be sharing throughout the presentation. So let's get started. During the program, you're going to learn about the Elizabeth Lawrence House and Garden, including her studio, which is nestled in a residential neighborhood in Charlotte, North Carolina. You will then hear about the Cherokee Garden Library and how the Elizabeth Lawrence collect collection ended up in Atlanta. Our speakers will then elaborate on four influential garden writers who inspired Elizabeth Lawrence. So who are the experts to share this presentation? Allow me to introduce our two panelists, each rich in Elizabeth Lawrence knowledge. Stacy Katrin is a library director specializing in the subject areas of American landscape history and historic landscape preservation. In her current position as the director of the Cherokee Garden Library Keenan Research Center at the Atlanta History Center, she manages the development, care, preservation, interpretation, and use of the collection comprised of over 33,000 items, including rare books, contemporary volumes, manuscripts, photographs, landscape architectural drawings, periodicals, seed catalogs, and ephemera. ephemera. <clears throat> Stacy also manages the annual Cherokee Garden Library Research Fellowship, which supports graduate students' research for the Georgia Historic Landscape Initiative. She holds a BA in History and Latin from Agnes Scott College in Decatur, Georgia, a primary teacher certification from the Association Montessori International, and a Master of Heritage Preservation from Georgia State University. Stacy has contributed to our to or served as curator for numerous exhibitions at the Atlanta History Center. Her articles and essays have been published in many magazines, newsletters, journals, and books. In 2005, she co-authored the award-winning book entitled Women in Atlanta, her most recent award-winning book is, is with co-author Marianne Eady, Seeking Eden, a collection of Georgia's historic gardens. Stacy is the past president of the Southern Garden History Society, chair of the Georgia National Register of Historic Places Review Board, vice president of Eastman's Atlanta Board of Directors, and a member of numerous clubs and organizations, including the Garden Club of Georgia's Historic Landscape Preservation Committee, the Garden Club of Virginia's Research Fellowship Committee, the Society of Georgia Archivists, the Southeastern Museum Conferences, and the Council on Botanical and Horticultural Libraries. Stacy is also a lifetime member of the Garden Club of Georgia and an honorary member of the Garden Club of America. Andrea Sprott is the garden curator at the Elizabeth Lawrence House and Garden of Winghaven, a position she has held since 2010. She is responsible for managing the entire property, which includes more than 1,700 taxa in its living collections and tens of thousands of research documents in its archive collections, as well as interpreting Lawrence's legacy for the public. Primarily self-taught and an admitted plantaholic, Andrea became a master gardener in 2003 and began volunteering in Winghaven's nursery in 2005. She lectures regularly on plants, gardening, and of course, all things Elizabeth Lawrence. She's a member of the Azalea Society of America, American Camellia Society, American Daffodil Society, North American Rock Garden Society, and currently serves on the board of directors of the Southern Garden History Society. Andre spends the rest of her time attempting to rein in the result of her plant addiction for the past 20 years on two acres in Southeast Charlotte, where she lives with her incredibly patient husband and their three dogs. So as you can see, we have two experts on our panel this morning. So take it away, Andrea. This is the gate of my garden. I invite you to enter in, not only into my garden, but into the world of gardens, a world as old as the history of man and as new as the latest contribution of science, a world of mystery, adventure, and romance, a world of poetry and philosophy, a world of beauty, and a world of work. That was the very first paragraph of the first article that Elizabeth Lawrence wrote for the Charlotte Observer. Elizabeth Lawrence was a tiny woman who made a huge impact on Southern horticulture through her timeless and engaging writing. 
She had a deep knowledge of and reverence for the past. She lived and gardened in the moment and was ahead of her time with the encouragement of embracing biodiversity and plant trial of material, plant material from all over the world. Today, Stacy and I will take you on a journey through the world of Elizabeth Lawrence and how four other women garden writers inspired and influenced her life's work. We begin our journey with Elizabeth Lawrence, who is best known for her work as a garden writer. She was born in Marietta, Georgia, but lived almost all her life in North Carolina, mainly in Raleigh and then Charlotte. She was quiet and inquisitive, always eager to learn and fascinated by plants. She had the mind of a scientist, the heart of a poet, and the hand of an artist. In 1922, she graduated from St. Mary's School in Raleigh. She went to Barnard College in New York City and earned a degree in English with a focus on the classics in 1926. She then returned home to Raleigh and then went on a months long trip touring Europe. After that, she returned home to Raleigh and then she went back to school. In 1932, Elizabeth was the first and only female graduate of the very first landscape architecture program offered at North Carolina State University. Throughout her life, she designed and consulted on numerous green spaces, although she really could not bear to be called a landscape architect. She was a very skilled and gifted designer, but it's her writing for which she became famous and for which she is still highly revered. She won some pretty impressive awards for her writing. The most prestigious of these was the Herbert Medal, the highest honor given by the Amaryllis Society, most recently known as the International Bulb Society. She was the first female to be given this award and one of only seven in 80 years of the award's existence. She was honored by the National Council of State Garden Clubs, and she was also honored by the American Horticultural Society and the North American Rock Garden Society. Quite simply put, Elizabeth Lawrence was one of America's greatest garden writers of the 20th century. This wonderful illustration by John Cash was published in 2004 in Horticulture Magazine, and it shows the world's greatest gardeners. So here are a few that you might recognize. There's Liberty Hyde Bailey, American horticulturist and botanist who co-founded the American Society for Horticultural Science. There's Beatrix Ferrand, American landscape architect and a founding member of the American Society of Landscape Architects. Thomas Jefferson, founding father and third president of the United States. There's Frederick Law Olmsted, the father of landscape architecture, who by the way is celebrating his 200th birthday in April. And he designed Central Park and Boston's Emerald Necklace of Parks, among other wonderful gardens. There's J.C. Ralston, an American uber plantsman and horticulturist and a tireless promoter of superior garden plants. Gertrude Jekyll, British horticulturist, designer, and author, who's considered really the high priestess of the herbaceous perennial border. There's Vita Sackville West, an English author and garden designer who created Sissinghurst. And oh, look who it is. There's our girl, Elizabeth Lawrence. She is in incredible company indeed. She's further considered one of the three biggest influences on Southern horticulture. And she shares that short list with Thomas Jefferson and J.C. Ralston. So how did Elizabeth Lawrence get to be such a horticultural and literary rock star? Well, she read a lot. She studied plants, design, and horticulture constantly. She was a natural born writer. Hardly a day went by when she didn't write several letters or work on an article or a manuscript or both. She connected with so many people. She wrote letters daily throughout her entire life. She belonged to several different plant societies. She lectured to garden clubs and groups all over the country. And of course, she had many readers. Over time, these connections formed a wide network that eventually spanned the globe and became a phenomenal resource from which she drew inspiration and tons of knowledge. And along the way, she cultivated lifelong friendships. So through this network, 
She compiled and cataloged an immense amount of information about every plant that she ever grew, every plant she ever read about or saw in other gardens or knew about through other gardeners. She kept bloom journals, extensive files. She kept scrapbooks, a mind boggling card index and a fascinating horticultural reference library. Elizabeth's keen attention to detail enhances her ability to make her readers see things from a different perspective. And I love this quote of hers. Once the relation between poetry and the soil is established in the mind, all growing things are endowed with more than material beauty. She has a naturally conversational poetic writing style that when combined with her nearly encyclopedic knowledge makes for fascinating reading. And to me, that's the bulk of what makes her writing still so loved today. Like I said, she was a prolific writer. Her first and best known book, A Southern Garden, a handbook for the Middle South was first published in 1942 and it was immediately lauded from coast to coast. She was still living in Raleigh when she wrote it and it's really mainly about her plant experiences in that garden. Elizabeth moved to Charlotte in 1948, and over the 36 years she lived here, she wrote manuscripts for five books, three of which were published in her lifetime. Shortly before her death, she made certain that boxes containing material that made up the other two manuscripts were given to a publisher. Fortunately, they got to the right hands and the material was thoughtfully edited and sub subsequently published. In addition to her manuscripts, Elizabeth wrote dozens of articles for magazines, garden clubs, and journals. And over 14 years, from 1957 to 1971, she wrote nearly 800 articles for her Sunday column for the Charlotte Observer. Writing for the Charlotte Observer was one of the greatest joys in her life and brought her an, audi an audience from near and far. Through her weekly column, readers came to know her garden really well and as well as the gardens of others. She encourages her readers to try something new in their own gardens, and she gives them the tools to create well-designed spaces that reflect their own personalities. She imparts a depth of knowledge that few, if any, other garden writers of the time do. Now, it was of utmost importance to Elizabeth that her life's work be shared. Her timeless writings tell us part of the story, but we also have her living legacy, her Charlotte garden, which began in 1948, even before the house was built. Because of her unwavering quest for knowledge and endless curiosity about plants, Elizabeth's garden quickly became known as experimental. She wanted to try every plant she could in order to find out what grows well for gardeners in this section, the Middle South. Some of these plants were Southern classics. Others were new introductions, rare specimens, and oddities. She was always pushing the boundaries to discover what plants might grow well here. In an article for the Charlotte Observer from September 22, 1963, she wrote, I spend my summers going through the catalogs, making notes of what I want to plant in the fall. I make lists and then tear them up and start all over again. I want everything I see and it is so hard to choose. I used to try a hundred or so new things each year, but as I grow older, the days seem to get shorter. Also, the garden gets fuller. Elizabeth suffered with chronic pain for many years. And in the late 1970s, she was really in declining health. After suffering a heart attack in 1983, Elizabeth made the decision to move to Maryland to live close to her niece. She sold her Charlotte home and garden and she left in 1984. Elizabeth Lawrence passed on June 11, 1985, but she left an indelible mark on the horticultural and literary history of the South. Today, the Elizabeth Lawrence House and Garden is owned and operated by the Winghaven Foundation and it's managed in a partnership with the Garden Conservancy. It's a unique dynamic historic property that serves to preserve and promote and celebrate the horticultural and literary legacy of one of America's best garden writers. 
We're open to the public year round, Wednesday through Saturday, 10 to five. Her garden showcases an ever changing diverse plant palette with something in bloom in every season. With over 2,200 taxa in its living collections now, many still original to Elizabeth, the small urban lot is a testament to her expert skill as a designer, a gardener and a plants woman, and of the incredible stewardship of her living legacy. The property is managed in Elizabeth's spirit. I actually try to kind of bring her th to life through her garden by studying her writings and her research and by understanding her aesthetic. After all, this is her garden. As it was created to be experimental, I still try all kinds of plants as she did, and I keep records of plant performance in a database, which we hope to share with the public in the future. It's never the same garden twice, always changing and always inspiring. And now I'll turn it over to Stacy so she can tell you all about the Cherokee Garden Library. Thanks so much, Andrea, for your outstanding stewardship of that important site and for that really in-depth, and I know you had such short time to give us so much information on Elizabeth Lawrence, but I think you um, beautifully conveyed her significance to the gardening world in that first segment. Thanks so much. And now I'm gonna share a little bit about the Cherokee Garden Library and how this special library became home to the Elizabeth Lawrence collection held here. The Keenan Research Center at the Atlanta History Center, here where I work, preserves extensive primary source holdings for the study of Atlanta and the surrounding region, including a special collection for Southeastern horticultural history in our Cherokee Garden Library. The Research Center, including the Garden Library, is open by appointment Tuesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., giving the public free and ready access to its collections for research. Founded by the Cherokee Garden Club of Atlanta in 1975, the Cherokee Garden Library gets its name from the state floral emblem of Georgia, the Cherokee Rose, which is pictured here. The library holds over 33,000 items, collects and preserves works in gardening, landscape design, garden history, horticulture, floral design, botanical art, plant ecology, natural landscape, and cultural landscapes. Ranging in date from 1586 to the present, the books, periodicals, manuscript collections, and visual arts collections tell diverse and fascinating stories of horticulture and botanical history and practitioners of both in the Southeastern United States, as well as areas of influence from throughout the world. The Cherokee Garden Library is very fortunate to be home to the Elizabeth Lawrence's collection, which includes her personal garden library. And this collection comprises over 500 books and is one of the cornerstones of the Cherokee Garden Library. The library also holds the Elizabeth Lawrence papers, which includes correspondence, newspaper articles, and notes which Elizabeth Lawrence originally filed within her garden books. So some of you may be curious to learn how the Cherokee Garden Library became home to the Elizabeth Lawrence collection. It's really a great story. In 1989, four years after Ms. Lawrence's death, Florence Griffin, an essential member of the Garden Library's Acquisitions Committee, was absolutely determined that the Cherokee Garden Library was going to acquire Elizabeth Lawrence's personal garden library. So Florence planned with her and her husband, Bill, along with one of the library's founders, Mary Tunky Miller, and her husband, Dr. Pat, to go to Annapolis, Maryland to meet with Florence's niece. After spending a good time together, they all chatted and talked and Denise really wanted her aunt's legacy to be preserved. They decided to make an offer, Denise graciously accepted, and the books, came to Atlanta. Interestingly, Margaret Block, who was a, the Garden Library president at the time, drove an old Plymouth van to Annapolis by herself, had the books loaded up, and brought them back to Atlanta, and then they became part of the Cherokee Garden Library. 
Thanks for that visual, Andrea. It's my favorite. <laughs> Volunteers including Louise Gunn, Trudy Madden, Tunky Miller, Lamar Oglesby, and Edie Wright went through Lawrence's books meticulously and sorted out all of the articles, notes, and letters they found within each volume. They carefully noted which book contained which letter, which specific item, so that we would have that knowledge. In more recent years, two of my volunteers, Claire Blackwell and Myrnie Williams, did a thorough update and went back through everything in great detail. And I can share the finding aid with you for those of you who are interested. Um, now, Claire and Myrnie are great big fans of Elizabeth Lawrence as well. And we are so lucky to have the Elizabeth Lawrence papers as well because they give us further insight into her life and her important work. So we're actually working here at the Elizabeth Lawrence House and Garden to recreate Elizabeth's library collection for her studio bookshelves. The effort began in 2009 with a very generous donation from Alan Lacey of part of his personal garden library. He donated 500 books and of those about 60 were ones that Elizabeth had in her collection. And in 2015, we were thrilled to receive over 250 volumes to further recreate the collection, thanks to an inc incredibly generous donation by a dear friend of Elizabeth's, Susan Richardson Wisnant Carpenter. Three cheers for volunteers <laughs> who helped me gleefully unpack several boxes of books. So we're still looking for about 162 volumes to complete the collection. So if you're interested in seeing what's needed, you can find a link on our website or you can email me for the list. That's so exciting to me because I love the idea of both collections being complete. I just love that. So we really do encourage people to help. So we're gonna enter into this segment of the talk where we talk about the four women garden writers we've selected who we feel have inspired and, and just been integral in Elizabeth's journey. So the first thing I always do when I make a new friend, just forewarning people in the audience if you become my friend, is what I like to do is I like to see what plants someone is growing in their garden and what books you have in your library. It's both give me great insight into an individual and her interest and deep passion. The Elizabeth Lawrence collection provides us a look into the brilliant mind of this remarkable woman. The range of subjects in her personal garden library is nothing short of impressive. There are books on annuals and perennials and wildflowers, as well as volumes about European garden history, garden design throughout the ages, plant lore, and even the symbolism of flowers. As you explore only a tiny portion of her studies, you quickly realize what an erudite person Elizabeth Lawrence was. I just wish I would have known her. Her collection holds many books by and about women gardeners, landscape designers, and writers. Today, Andre and I will begin to just barely scratch the surface by looking at four women in Lawrence's collection. Gertrude Jekyll, Jane Loudon, Eleanor Sinclair Road, and Vita Sackville West. The Elizabeth Lawrence collection holds 12 books by Gertrude Jekyll and two biographies about this iconic figure who is considered one of the most important garden designers of the 20th century. Jekyll was a British garden designer, artist, photographer, and writer who created hundreds and hundreds of gardens in the United Kingdom, Europe, and the United States. In addition to writing over a dozen popular garden books, Jekyll, like Lawrence, wrote hundreds of articles um, for her counterpart there. Of course, she wrote for very impressive garden magazines like Country Life. Um, according to landscape historian Judith Tankard, Jekyll, quote, laid the basis for modern garden design and is credited with popularizing an informal naturalistic look and counterpoint to the rigid formal landscapes of the Victorian era, end quote. Jekyll always considered color, texture, and fragrance in her garden designs. She is often remembered for her subtle artistic approach to the arrangement of gardens, and of course, her massive herbaceous borders. 
Elizabeth Lawrence was obviously a fan of Gertrude Jekyll, and she not only held the 12 of her books in her personal library, but she also wrote the introduction to this volume, On Gardening, an anthology chosen from 10 of Jekyll's books published in 1964. In her introduction to this book, Elizabeth writes, in an age of fine writing and fine gardening, Gertrude Jekyll excelled in both. The advice she gave to gardeners is as sound today as it was when she first offered it to her readers, and I am delighted to see it again in print. Florence frequently referred to Jekyll in her article she wrote for the Charlotte Observer, showing not only her appreciation for Jekyll, but also their shared interest in many facets of gardening and garden design. In her 1966 article entitled Walks and Paths are Colorful, Elizabeth writes, with these limits in mind, the width of the path is finally decided by its length and its surroundings, but it is always better for it to be too wide than too narrow, especially in gardens where plants or shrubs are apt to encroach upon the edges. Lawrence then goes on to describe the main path in her own garden, which is about six feet in width and over a hundred feet long. She writes, longer paths or even shorter ones may be wider. For example, in a large garden designed by Gertrude Jekyll, there's a path 10 feet wide and nearly 200 feet long. Another of the same width is less than 100 feet in length. So one of the clever design tricks that Elizabeth used here in her garden was to narrow, <clears throat> excuse me, was to narrow the main path by one foot, which forces perspective and it makes the garden seem larger than it really is. So the path starts out at the house end, which is the, the end that is the, at the bottom of the photograph. So it starts out at a, a width of six feet, six inches, and then it narrows to a width of five feet, six inches toward the back of the garden. The wide path really eases your stroll and it allows you to take in all that meets your eyes in the borders without feeling crowded or rushed. I love her path so much and I'm so grateful. <laughs> I've been able to walk on it so many times. And Gardening is Full of Surprises from 1969, Elizabeth shares her thoughts on the wayside lilies and then on the still uncommon Henry's lily. Lilium Henryi comes next, this year on the 7th of July, which is very early. Gertrude Jekyll describes the flower as of a strong and yet soft orange color. The plant, she says, impresses one with a feeling of vigor and well-being. Mine, on the contrary, lay themselves out flat on the ground as soon as they are ready to bloom. And I always forget to stake them before that happens. <laughs> one thing I love about Elizabeth's writings is that she is always like, she's telling you like it is. <laughs> and at all of you gardeners out there, myself included, we all know how that feels <laughs> when we forget to stake something. So I took this photo this year on the 3rd of July. And this is Elizabeth's original Lilium Henryi, which she planted, believe it or not, in November of 1949. With so many blooms at the top of that seven foot tall stem, it definitely, it definitely would still lie flat on the ground if I don't remember to stick it. It's just so beautiful, I love that image. Elizabeth Lawrence had the lovely habit of putting light pencil marks and words in the margins of her books, which of course we call marginalia, giving us further insight into what these women writers meant to her. In Jekyll's Color Schemes for the Flower Garden, Lawrence places a long pencil line by this passage pertaining to a blue garden. The brilliancy and purity of color almost incredible. Surely no blue flowers were ever so blue before. That is the impression received. For one thing, all the blue flowers used, with the exception of Eryngium and Clematis duvidiana, are quite pure blues. Those two are gray blues. There are no purple blues, such as the bluest of the Campanulas and the perennial lupines. They would not be admissible. So Elizabeth Lawrence had a near obsession with color. And I've discovered from her records and some of her correspondence that she was apparently quite fond of the color blue. 
in her garden as well as in her clothing. In a letter, one of her friends teased her about how she loved her blues and whites. In most of the color photos we have of her, she's wearing blue. Blue is a calming color. It's one of ease and of coolness. And her garden goes through sort of waves of color throughout the year. One season eases into the next. And as she put it, the gardening year really has no beginning and no end. It's difficult to capture in photos, but when you see it week after week or month after month in person, it's much more apparent. It seems so effortless, which is really the intent. There's careful consideration of timing and color combinations. I'm sure that Elizabeth was influenced by Jekyll in this way. It's an artistic and intellectual way to garden. I'm definitely still learning. So next we will move on to another favorite in Elizabeth's collection, the English garden writer and botanical illustrator, Jane Loudon, who wrote 18 books during her lifetime. Lawrence's collection has 12 of Loudon's books and one biography about Jane entitled Lady with Green Fingers. Jane Loudon created beautifully illustrated volumes on gardening and plant identification, which were sold in the thousands to women all over England and beyond. Loudon made gardening more accessible to women, particularly those of the new burgeoning middle class in England during the 19th century. She was also a self-taught artist, her illustrations involved grouping the flowers to form bouquets, which made her designs even more popular. Likely due to the age of the books, Elizabeth did not make pencil marks or notations in her Jane Loudon books, but you can tell by just looking at them that she adored each volume and enjoyed them thoroughly. Elizabeth did frequently refer to and quote Loudon in her Charlotte Observer articles. The first mention is in a 19th 1958 article in which she encourages her readers to enjoy a display of rare garden books that are being shown there, and they're from the library of William Billy Lanier Hunt. As some of you know, Hunt was a North Carolina botanist, garden designer, and garden writer, and he led the effort to establish the North Carolina Botanical Garden, and he was also a founding member of the Southern Garden History Society. In this article, Elizabeth shares that four of Jane Loudon's books were on display and she states, Mrs. Loudon is as dear to me as she must have been to the early Victorian ladies for whom she wrote, advising them how to decorate their homes, how to manage their households and how to plant their gardens. Then we learned another really fun detail from Elizabeth. I have one shabby little brown volume of hers that my mother bought for 35 cents in a secondhand bookstore. It is called The Lady's Companion to the Flower Garden. I often open it to see what Mrs. Loudon has to say of a plant I'm writing about and seldom close it without picking up some valuable bit of firsthand information or without being amused by some witty observation. So I've actually, um, we actually know that Catherine White, editor of The New Yorker and wife of author E.B. White, sent Elizabeth a copy of Loudon's Ladies' Annuals. And I believe it was in a letter to Catherine that Elizabeth wrote, as soon as the package arrived, she dropped everything she was doing, which was quite a lot at the time. She plopped down in the middle of the floor of her studio and spent the rest of the evening all consumed by the book. It was obviously an incredible gift for her to receive such a treasure. Well, I would love for someone to send me a book. Me what too. A gift. What a gift. In a 1960 article, we see Elizabeth emphasize the importance of fragrance in the garden. When she quotes Jane Loudon, who is giving advice to her young friend, Annie. I think nothing can be more delightful than to throw open your windows and to inhale a refreshing odor from growing flowers when they are swept over by a balmy breeze, particularly after a slight shower. And for this purpose, I would strongly recommend you to plant flowers near your windows, which have a refreshing but not heavy scent. The flowers of the evergreen magnolia and those of the orange have an oppressive fragrance as have those of the heliotrope and the tuberose. But those of the mignonette, 
the lemon scented verbena, the rose and the violet are refreshing. And at the same time that they yield a delicious perfume. So Elizabeth liked to have uh, one fragrance at a time in her garden. About two weeks ago, every tea olive here in her garden was at its height, which was sublime for like the first 15 minutes, <laughs> which was perfect for visitors. <laughs> but coming next month will be the winter suite. Elizabeth loved its scent so much and planted it outside her bedroom window. And she, like Jane, also loved the scents of lemon verbena, rose, and violet. In a February 1960 article, Elizabeth shares, every spring when the new catalogs come, I sit down to make a list of tender and half hearty annuals to plant as soon as frost is out of the ground. This year, making the list is an unusually joyful occasion as I have been given a copy of the Ladies Flower Garden of Ornamental Annuals, one of Mrs. Loudon's chattiest and most beautifully illustrated books. Here, Lawrence is referring to Loudon's second edition of this work from 1849 with its exquisite marble boards and gorgeous botanical illustrations inside. And this is the one Catherine White sent to Elizabeth, which is so exciting. That's right. So now we know from whom she received this book. <laughs> So Elizabeth was also a gifted artist. Um, she studied all kinds of fine art. She even lectured on the subject. I'm certain that she found Loudon's books exquisite, they being works of art um, in, the, in and of themselves, as well as practically informative. In her June 62 article, we learn about Lawrence's interest in Buckeyes. I've just recently de developed a big interest in Buckeyes, so this fascinated me. So in the article, she writes, in spite of the fact that their flowers are plentiful, there are very few buckeyes and those few disappear before I can gather them. Last summer, I found out where they go. I caught a chipmunk lugging one into his tunnel. Lacking seed, propagation is by division. Nuts of other species are poisonous. Though Mrs. Loudon says in her Botany for Ladies that those of this species are edible and that when boiled in milk that they taste like chestnuts. She says that the shiny red brown nut is like the eye of a stag, the scar being the pupil. So that's where the name comes from. So it's true, Elizabeth's bottle brush buckeye, which is shown here, the Aeschylus parviflora, it hardly ever fruits. I may have found uh, one or two in the past 11 years, but her painted buckeye, the Aeschylus sylvatica, fruits every single year. I gather the Buckeyes as soon as they're ripe and I pot them up. And now I'm reminded that chipmunks in this garden are going hungry, but maybe that's not altogether a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> now we turn to another favorite found in Elizabeth's collection, Eleanor Sinclair Rode. Rode was a British gardener, garden designer and writer. She authored 30 books in her lifetime. Good grief. Between the years of 1913 and 1948. I'm slack. I need to get busy. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence had seven of Rhodes volumes in her collection, including A Garden of Herbs, The Old English Gardening Book, The Story of the Garden, and Rhodes' most well-known volume, The Scented Garden from 1931. Lawrence shared a recipe of dandelion wine with her readers on July 3rd, 1960, from the article, Dandelions are excellent as food, wine or tea. Who knew? I didn't. In A Garden of Herbs, Miss Rowe tells how to make dandelion tea and gives a recipe for dandelion wine. The latter yields nine gallons and calls for dandelion pips, the best demerara sugar, hops, brown ginger, lemon, Seville oranges, and a little brewer's yeast. It is kept in a barrel for six months before bottling. In this same article, Lawrence also shares another recipe for dandelion wine with her readers. A reader had asked me for the receipt for dandelion wine. I copied the receipt out of Miss Rhodes' book, A Garden of Herbs, and right after I sent it off, I found another in the flower grower for August. Miss Purcell was so taken by this recipe 
recipe that I thought other people might like to have it too. So here it goes, audience, and we're going to put it in the chat so you'll have it. Two quarts dandelion flowers, one gallon water, juice and rind of two oranges, juice and rind of two lemons, two tablespoons of yeast, three pounds of loaf sugar. Put the flowers in water and bring to a boil. Add the rind of the oranges and lemons and the sugar and boil for an hour. Strain and when nearly cold, strain and when nearly cold, add the yeast. Bottle the next day, adding the juices from the oranges and lemons. And here's the crazy part. And also a few raisins. I don't know what that's about. Do not cork down until it has all done working, which will be in about three weeks time. So Elizabeth was actually not much for eating or cooking for that matter, but she was really interested in knowing the uses of plants. And she would try out different recipes like this from time to time. One of the things that I love about Elizabeth, there are many, many things, but one of the things I love about her is her mastery with taking a plant that we all think of as a noxious weed and then showing it in, in a different light and thereby possibly changing our perspective and definitely deepening our appreciation. So the day before Christmas in 1967, Elizabeth's article is entitled, Mary Gardens Were Popular with Artists. And I really like this turn because we're gonna just get a little further into the brilliant brain of Elizabeth. In this article, she quotes Eleanor Road extensively including this passage. The beauty of holiness is symbolized by the beauty of the flowers. Elizabeth goes on to write, the garden Miss Rowe chooses to picture and describe is by an unknown German artist of the 15th century. In it, the virgin is seated beside a table reading a book. On the table are apples and bread and wine. The holy child is seated on a flowery lawn playing with a string instrument held by an angel. The angel wears a delicate crown of flowers and the virgin is crowned with leaves. In Elizabeth's copy of Rose's Story of the Garden, we find a large pencil mark by two notations. The first says birds, she writes, and then flowers of evil repute. And this is next to this passage describing another painting of a merry garden. The fruit symbolizes, excuse me, the fruit symbolizes in, in this painting of a merry garden, cherries and apples. The cherry signifies the joys of heaven and the apple, the sorrows of earth. I've never, obviously I'm not very well read. The cherry <laughs> signifies the joys of heaven and the apple, the sorrows, sorrows of earth. In this picture, the holy child seated on the mother's knee holds cherries in his left hand, whilst with the other, he takes an apple from the hand of an angel. Here and there, it seems possible to discern the plants of evil repute. What are these plants of evil repute, you say? <laughs> Nettles and hellebores. Well, boy, oh boy, I've got lots of plants of evil repute in my garden. But unlike the other flowers, they are obscure and seem to fade into insignificance in the presence of the light of the world, which is the holy child. So it's been said that a place that seemed to mean a lot to Elizabeth in her garden was at the end of the main path, right in front of a plaster cast of the Madonna. It's a replica of a marble sculpture called Madonna and Child with Cherubim, which was done by Antonio Rossellino in the 1450s. The original sculpture was purchased by J. Pierpont Morgan in 1902, and it's on permanent display in his study in New York City. And I had the great good fortune to get to see it in person a couple years ago, um, and it was thrilling. It was just thrilling. So Elizabeth purchased her piece in 1927 while she was taking that tour in Europe and she purchased it in Italy. It was shipped back to the States, but it was broken into several pieces upon arrival. She later recalled that she had to put it back together like a jigsaw puzzle. Periodically, she would call on her niece and nephew who lived next door to come freshen up the paint on the Madonna. When they grew up and moved away, 
it was left to fade for decades until in 2018, her nephew, Warren Way, retrieved the piece to fix the cracks and once again freshen the paint. Today, the Madonna is back in her place at the end of the main path, once again hanging for all to enjoy. Oh, it's just such a special place in the garden and such a wonderful story. Thank you, Andrea. The last woman we will discuss this morning, who was an important part of Lawrence's library, is Vita Sackville West. Elizabeth had four books by the celebrated English author, including her English Country Houses, A Joy of Gardening, A Selection for Americans. Apparently we needed our own selection. That's good to know. A book of poetry entitled The Garden and a group of letters published after her death entitled Dearest Andrew. Sackville West was a successful novelist, journalist, and poet. Um, for me personally, um, my three favorite books by Vita are The Edwardians, all Passions Spent, and Portrait of a Lady. Love to know what your favorite books are by Vita. Vita is often remembered as the inspiration for the protagonist in the famous book, Orlando, written by her friend and lover, Virginia Woolf. Sackville West created the remarkable garden at Sissinghurst with her husband, Sir Harold Nicholson. Some of you, like myself, may have had the great fortune of getting to visit Sissinghurst in England, which of course is now owned and operated by the National Trust and open to the public. As with the other women we discussed this morning, Lawrence frequently references and quotes Vita in her Charlotte Observer articles. She includes a thoughtful review of the Garden Book, you see here, an anthology of articles on gardening written by Sackville West for the London Observer between 1947 and 1961. Are you all starting to see these threads? All these women are writing books. All of them are writing hundreds and hundreds of articles. Oh, there's a lot of synergy here. In this article, Elizabeth says, which she calls, which I love this, it just made me laugh out loud. Very English, very Kentish. We learn that Elizabeth has borrowed the book from her friend, Linda Lamb, which is why we don't find it among her books in the Lawrence collection here. And in it, she gives this great opinion about Vita Sackville West. Her easy and intimate style led her readers to look upon her as a friend and fellow gardener, forgetting that she was born in Knoll, one of the greatest of England's great houses, and moved them to write sometimes more than 100 letters a week to her, telling about their own flowers and asking about her advice. I love the quote that you picked out, Stacy. Her easy and intimate style led her readers to look upon her as a friend and fellow gardener. Elizabeth's writing has the same effect. It's conversational, it's easy, it's intimate. I often say that, that reading her writing is like sitting by the fire with her chatting one-on-one. -on -one. Also in the same article, Elizabeth described her feeling when she visited Sissinghurst the previous May. And she wrote, when I was there last May, I felt her presence still as if I might come upon her at any moment. And that speaks to me because that's exactly what I strive for. When visitors come here, I want them to feel Elizabeth's presence in this space as I do. Well, I've been to the garden many times, Andrea, and I feel you have accomplished that. And it's, it's just such a gift, Thank it's you. such a gift to, to <laughs> visit there and spend time in Elizabeth's garden. Lawrence writes about Sixinghurst in a 1967 article. And I love this passage we found as well, sharing Miss Sackville West did the planting, a reckless and lavish mingling of color and form and a tangle of roses and honeysuckle on the old walls. The result is the English tradition of formal design and informal planting. So I find um, her use of the terms reckless and lavish and tangle very interesting. And upon first reading it, it gave me the impression somewhat of distaste. But then as I thought about it, the words actually might be complimentary. It takes a lot of careful work to create a garden that is reckless, lavish, 
and a tangle, while at the same time encapsulating, as Elizabeth put it, the English tradition of formal design and informal planting. And she would have thought all of that through before using such strong words in her article. And in fact, Elizabeth designed and planted her own garden to have that same formal design with seemingly informal planting. But when you truly study it, much study and careful work went and still goes into creating that effect. Well, among the four volumes Elizabeth holds of Sackville West's writing, she gravitates to her book of poems and marks many passages. Here it is. I actually pulled it off the shelf so you could see this sweet copy. And Andrea and I thought it would be fun to just share a few that Lawrence marked and that we also love. So I'll let Andrea begin. Garden finds symphonies of leaves and water the ilex and the fountain and the cool, nymph dipping marble foot in living pool. Oh, I love that. And since the garden's backbone is the hedge, shaping to seemly order, set it square, not in weak curves that half deny the pledge, given to pattern and intent austere, garden should be romantic, but severe. Yet still my little garden craft I ply, mulch, hoe, and water when the ground is dry. Cutting seed heads, thin out the stoning fruit, cut out the unwanted, tie the wanted, shoot. Weed paths that with one summer shower of rain for all my labor are as green again. And strive on, for there is no repose, even though summer redden with the rose. Oh, I love that. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> the Elizabeth Lawrence collection holds many valuable resources on 19th and 20th century women's horticultural literature. And what Andrea and I shared this morning is only a very tiny glimpse into Elizabeth's incredible collection and amazing mind. And as we think about how we live in garden in the 21st century, we are grateful to Elizabeth Lawrence and other women garden writers for continuing to inspire us to dream of and create gardens and books of our very own. Hi everyone. <laughs> wow, that was a lot of information. And I hope that everyone out there in the audience enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, these two women you see before you are truly experts when it comes to Elizabeth Lawrence. So I have all the confidence in both of them that any questions that you have, they'll be able to answer or find the answer for you. So um, as we go through, I've got some questions uh, right now, but please um, feel free to keep adding them into the Q&A feature of Zoom and we'll get to it, okay? So we're gonna get started. Um, first of all, I just I was tickled during the chat. Uh, I had the ability to, to review the chat as Andrea and um, Stacy were speaking and there was a little hot debate about the pronunciation of Jekyll. And um, I was just thrilled, and it is Jekyll. And I was just thrilled, of course, Stacy knows that, <laughs> that uh, nobody caught me as I mispronounced during Stacy's bio the word ephemera. So I was tongue twisted on that. So I'm glad that the librarians and archivists in the group didn't, uh, didn't uh, you know, <clears throat> mention that in the chat. <clears throat> okay. So one of the questions I think um, at, you were just wrapping up about the inspiration about these, these uh, women garden writers. And the question is, so why these four? I mean, there, might have, there must have been many more. So how did the two of you come up with these four? Okay, I'm gonna start, Stacy, but I'll quickly turn it over to you. So from my perspective, um, when Stacy and I were talking about this, we were like, um, ha, uh, you know, how do we pick these, these people? Cause there are so many, but, um, and, and Elizabeth was in, inspired by and influenced by many different garden writers and actually many different writers, not just garden writers. Um, but Stacy, from your perspective, I want you to tell why. 
Well, one thing um, when I was looking through Elizabeth's books, I mean, there are many other writers, obviously, in the 500 plus volumes. Um, but when I was looking, these four were the ones where it looked like she had opened the books the most, and these books had the most notations, with the exception of the Jane Robin books. So that was part of my thought process when I, when Andre and I were having our conversations. And then when we were looking at her Charlotte Observer articles, these were the four that came up dozens of times in her articles, not just mentioned once or twice or three times. So I think that also helped sort of guide the selection of these four. Yeah. I hope that answers it. I think I, that answers the question, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, Jill, you're muted. You know, I there am, sorry about that. <clears throat> I just didn't want you to hear the background noise um, here in the office. Um, yes, I think that answered the question. Thank you both very much. Speaking of the Charlotte Observer articles that you were just mentioning, um, Andrea, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe there's over 800. Yes. Uh, over 800 articles. Mm -hmm. Somebody would like to know, do we have them all? Can we access them all? Can we read them all? Well, we... We don't have them all. Um, we have many of them, most of them. Um, no, that's a lie. I didn't mean to tell a lie. We have, <laughs> we have almost half. But um, actually, uh, you know, Elizabeth saved, she clipped artic her own articles out and was saving them. And um, I know that some of them are in Atlanta with Stacy because she would take them, fold them up and shove them, shove them in her books. And then right. they ended up, you know, with, uh, with Stacy there. But we do have, we do have many, 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 we have hundreds of them. Um, and we, I actually, I've got a subscription to newspapers.com, which is awesome. And um, so that's, uh, that's how I can readily access all of them there. Um, so that's a, a great digital resource for me. But if you happen to just have like original newspaper clippings of Elizabeth's articles, <laughs> call me. Um, I'll send you my address. And that would be awesome because we would love to have, you know, the actual original copies because sometimes when they've scanned the newspapers and put them, uh, you know, made them available, to um to newspapers.com they're not as great as having the original um paper in your hand so but yes we're we're collecting those if you've got them we'd love to have them <laughs> and stacy did you want to add to that about what's what you have at cherokee garden library we do have a few of her newspaper articles that she put within her books and that's in the elizabeth lawrence papers but like Andrea, the majority of them, I access through our subscription here, um, newspapers.com, because they're all there and available through that search engine. Okay. So, and Andrea, you had mentioned that, you know, the, the articles ended up in the collection that is at Cherokee Garden Library because Elizabeth stuck them in here herself, right? So along those lines, as you both were reading quotes from Vita, um, there were check marks and squiggle marks in the books. Were those your marks or were those Elizabeth's marks in her books? So did she? Those are Elizabeth's marks. I so mean, she... I sort of view her books like a shrine. <laughs> I would never put even one. I mean, I would never even consider marking in her books. I mean, they're her marks. And that's how we know what meant something to her is because it's her marginalia. It's her thought that she sat down with and studied these books over and over and decided what was meaningful to her. It's a good question. Yeah. And I, I mean, I love that, you know, the, the pictures that we showed, Stacy spent hours and hours pulling the books and photographing those marks and the check marks and the pencil lines and, and all the marginalia. And, and yeah, um, of some of the first source material that we have that was common for Elizabeth to do that. Um, she would save other people's, she'd clip other writers' articles and put them in files and she would mark the passages, you know, and she had a very interesting um, brain. She had a, a way of um, 
uh, creating sort of reference points and, and going back so that she could readily go back to these, these things and use them in articles or just because she was curious. Okay, great. Um, the questions are rapidly coming in. So I'm, um, I'm gonna bounce around a little bit, but we'll go back to the books. I know we have somebody here in Charlotte asking this question. Um, can visitors go to the Cherokee Garden Library and actually review and read her books? Of course. Um, as I mentioned early in the program, we are open Tuesday through Saturday by appointment, free of charge, 10 to 5. So if you happen to be visiting Atlanta, I know there are Charlotte folks that have family and friends in Atlanta, just reach out to me and um, we can drop my email in the chat, one of my colleagues hopefully can, and we'll make an appointment and you can spend as many days as you like going through Elizabeth's books here. We would be honored to have you come visit. Okay. And back to the Charlotte Observer, another question just rolled in. Um, what was the name of the column that she wrote? Well, it was originally called Through the Garden Gate. Um, and there are, um, there are actually two books that are compilations that of her Charlotte Observer articles. Um, the first one was called Through the Garden Gate or is still called Through the Garden Gate. Um, but, you know, they didn't always use that heading um, when they printed. I've noticed that, you know, they did sometimes, but then sometimes they didn't. But she, yeah, it was called Through the Garden Gate. The other book, by the way, the compilation, which I adore, is Beautiful at All Seasons. I, I, that's new to me. I learned, I just learned something. Thank you. Um, people are really asking these, they really want to know about this collection. So, um, awesome. is Elizabeth's full collection housed in the Cherokee Garden Library or are some of her papers and records still being uncovered? Well, her papers, what happened was her garden library books came here and within those books, there were things she saved and that's what's here at the Cherokee Garden Library. But there are other Elizabeth Lawrence collections at the Elizabeth Lawrence House and Garden and also other places. Andrea, do you wanna to speak to that or would you like me? Sure, sure. So Elizabeth Lawrence um, sent the bulk of her uh, personal and professional papers to Northwestern State University in Louisiana to their archive. And um, I know people are gonna ask why in the heck she chose Louisiana, but, uh, and, and I'll just go ahead and answer that because I know that question's gonna roll in. So she chose Northwestern State because um, her dear friend, Caroline Dorman, um, who some people call uh, Louisiana's Elizabeth Lawrence, um, was making plans to have her papers uh, archived at Northwestern State University in their archive there. And um, the intention for Elizabeth uh, I think I said it in the in the presentation that it really was of utmost importance that her life's work be shared. And at that time, uh, the obvious choice for Elizabeth would have been to send her papers to like Chapel Hill um, to the library. Um, but at the time, the impression or the reputation was that her papers would have gone to Chapel Hill and stayed in a box in the basement and never to be seen again. And that was absolutely not what she wanted to have happen. So um, with the, um, the hope and, and the desire for her work to be shared, she sent um, her papers on to Northwestern State University. And uh, there are there are a couple of other places. I think that um, Duke University Special Collections, they have some, uh, maybe some correspondence that people have, have shared with them from Elizabeth or to Elizabeth. But uh, yeah, the bulk of her papers are, are there in Louisiana. Um, it's interesting. She has, um, her legacy is, is truly all over. The it South. is. Mm -hmm. Atlanta, Charlotte, now in Louisiana, and I'm I'm sure other libraries and places, not to mention her mark that's been made on car gardens all over the place. But um, all right, speaking of gardens, um, <clears throat> we have someone, Kim has um, written in here, Elizabeth Lawrence's garden is so reminiscent of garden aesthetics known for my living in Ireland. So many of the same plants grow in her gardens. 
was her experimental garden mostly focused on introducing that style of planting that grow well in the Mid-South? Was there a focus on North Carolina Southeast, Southeast native plants interspersed? Um, so Elizabeth was a total Anglophile. And, and I think, you know, that's one of the reasons that the, you know, that these authors meant a lot to her, these women garden writers. Um, but so her garden, you know, I, I think definitely she was influenced by, um, by the English School of Gardening, but she really became interested in native plants because her whole thing was trying to find things that, that grow well in the Middle South. And um, yeah, so she interspersed native plants um, with non-native plants. She really did embrace biodiversity, but she did recognize uh, and, and promote native plants. She was a member of the um, North Carolina Wildflower Society and um, made a point to go to many, if most of their meetings um, as she could. But uh, yeah, so she was, I, I say she didn't discriminate. You know, she, um, she incorporated native and non-native just because that was her whole purpose. One of, I wanna know what grows well here. And it's really fascinating to me actually to look at a border and, and, uh, and, tr and think about that. It's, it's not as easy to incorporate um, native plants in a garden as one would think, to me, especially a public garden space, yeah. Okay, that might have opened a whole different can of worms, which I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. This is this is the group to, to have that discussion, to have that conversation. So feel free to react. Um, we're gonna bounce around and talk about Elizabeth the person. So why did Elizabeth Lawrence prefer not to be called a landscape architect, especially considering her status as the first female graduate of the North Carolina State Landscape Architecture Program? Oh, Boy, that's a, that's a good question. That's all you, Andrea, but that is a really good question. <laughs> well, I think I, I think the answer is for her, she looked at herself as, and she referred to herself as a dirt gardener. She, um, she didn't, hmm. I don't know how to answer this like diplomatically without sounding horrible. Um, and that didn't come out right either, but I'm gonna <laughs> run with it anyway. Um, I think that landscape architects more often than not are not as interested in plants for the plants themselves. They're, inter they're more interested and face uh, and, and put more of a focus on uh, the structure, the hardscape, and, and they don't know as much or focus as much on the plant material. And I think that's something that really bothered her. Um, and, and I'm going to go a little bit out on a limb here and tell you just a brief uh, encounter, a brief bit about uh, Ellen Biddle Shipman, who was uh, an amazing um, female landscape architect. And she came here and stayed in this house, um, stayed overnight with Elizabeth Lawrence. And Elizabeth really grilled her about how in the world can you design gardens all over the country without knowing the different soils, the different climates, without studying the different plant material. It really seemed like when I read um, uh, a writing about this encounter and how Elizabeth, you know, the questions Elizabeth uh, asked Ellen, it really seemed um, like she was just like, how in the world can you do that? Because that's, that's not right. Like you can't truly create a, a garden, a, a good garden. You can't create that without knowing those things, without knowing about the soils in that area, without knowing about the climate, without knowing about the plants that grow well there. So I think that's one of the, the, probably the biggest reason she did not like being called a landscape architect. She was more, uh, I think she really wanted to be known more as, she wanted to be known first and foremost as a garden writer, but then also as a dirt gardener. And she never put herself above anyone else's level 
she, you know, and that's one of the greatest endearing things about her, that she admits her, her failures and as well as her successes. So I hope that answers the question. That was a great answer. <laughs> I was glad to learn about it too. And I had no idea that Ellen Shipman had visited Elizabeth Warren. So my mind just blew up. But anyway. <laughs> there are many. Wow. There are what? Like Ellen Shipman was at Elizabeth Warren's house. I know yeah. there's so many rock stars that have been through this place that like I should really just start a list, you know, and like it's it's pretty intimidating. And I get to work here. I'm so lucky. <laughs> so and I, Andrea. You know, I, I think that's interesting, Andrea, if y'all don't mind me just taking a little bit further. I think landscape architects in different generations were trained to, you know, not to focus as much on plants, but there are exceptions. Sure. You know, of which, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'll have to ask him. I'll ask him, but Ed Dorery, for example, um, who's 94 today in Atlanta, Georgia, a oh, landscape architect birthday. who is a mentor and I admire more than pretty much almost anyone, but maybe a little bit more. Um, you know, he has been a landscape architect and hung his shingle out in 1953 and brilliant, but he is also a true plantsman. But I feel like he is um, an exception and others on this call may agree or disagree with me, but I feel like, you know, um, he is an exception a lot of LAs, um, maybe now it's different the way people are trained, but in previous generations, I think that I would understand why Elizabeth would feel that way. Yeah. So Andrea, you mentioned um, all these famous rock stars that came through Elizabeth Lawrence's uh, house and stayed with her, visited with her, worked with her perhaps. Um, that sounds like a great topic for our mm -hmm. monthly Imbibe and Inspire program. So yeah. as the director of education, I'm going to give a little plug and I'm going to pop it into the chat. We do a monthly virtual program for those of the, you would like to learn more about Elizabeth Lawrence um, as a person, as a gardener, as a dirt gardener, um, as a writer. Um, we do this monthly and we happen to be launching the October program about camellias tomorrow. It's not too late to register. You can register all month long and there is it is a recording. So you can register all uh, month long and there's personal Q&A throughout the month with Andrea. So I'm going to pop it into the chat right now. Back to the questions. Um, <clears throat> so more about the books. Um, and I'll say this too, if Monique could pop into the chat, um, the book, Elizabeth Lawrence's books that she wrote, not the books that inspired her are available on our online um, shop. And if Monique could pop that link in there for those that are interested. Bonnie is asking, love Miss Lawrence's Lobs Wood, which is the title of one of her books. Is this included in your collection? It is here at the Cherokee Garden Library. And interestingly, it's actually one of my writings um, by Elizabeth Lawrence. And of course, everyone has, if you love Elizabeth Lawrence, everyone has their favorite favorite. So I'm just going to go ahead and own that my favorite favorite is Gardens in Winter. What's your favorite favorite, Andrea? <laughs> it's, it's Gardens in Winter. I mean, and it's so unfortunate that it's not in print anymore. So if you yeah. find a copy, I highly recommend that you get it. Um, and yeah, that's my favorite. But I, I will just give a, a shout out to Lobswood because 2021, this year, is the 50th anniversary of that manuscript. And Elizabeth wrote the manuscript and gifted it to the Cincinnati Nature Center, which now owns um, Lobswood, the actual property. And so. it's a great read. I mean, I've probably mm -hmm. read Lobswood six or seven times and I probably should read it again because every time I read it, I enjoy it thoroughly. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of good stuff in there. Okay, I am... Um... One of our uh, audience members has been very patient. They have asked this question 45 minutes ago, <laughs> but I was waiting for the right time to ask. So we have about three or four more questions and about 10 minutes left. So I think we'll be able to get through everything. Um, the question uh, is directed to Andre, I believe. When was the property of Winghaven acquired? Um, I think specifically the property of Elizabeth Lawrence. Did someone live there after she left or did it become a museum right away? Okay, so the, um, the, I'm gonna start 
back with when Elizabeth left in uh, 1984. She sold the property to a gentleman named Jim Summers. And Jim um, lived here for about 18 months. And uh, he, he was here for a short time because of changing circumstances in his personal life. Um, but he, he was not so much a gardener, um, but he actually brought volunteers who knew this garden. He brought them from Winghaven Garden and Bird Sanctuary, which is literally 10 houses up the street, same side of the street. And, and that is the, the property um, that started everything. It started the Winghaven Foundation. And, and so uh, volunteers from there came down here to help Jim sort of get the garden a, a little bit uncovered because Elizabeth was ill, couldn't really um, tend it as, as she would have um, in later years. Uh, so, so it's really awesome that Jim didn't change much of anything in the garden in that 18 months. That's, that's great. And then he sold um, the, the property because of, like I said, changing circumstances in his life. And that's when I feel like uh, Elizabeth Lawrence was uh, like playing puppet master. I talk about anybody who's around me at all knows that I talk about this a lot. Um, I think that Elizabeth uh, from beyond, she brings people in the path. She puts people in the path of this property uh, who need to be there at the right time. And she definitely did that with Lindy Wilson. Yeah, who, we're not going to go cry. I'm not sorry. Cry. Go sorry. <laughs> Lindy purchased this property. She was a single mom with her own business, an avid gardener. And she purchased this property and um, she did not purchase it because it was Elizabeth Lawrence's property. She purchased it because it was a, a, a place that was in like the right area for her kids to go to school and because it was close to her business or closer to her business than she was before. And Lindy very quickly realized that there was something very magical about this property. And um, she lived and gardened here for almost 23 years. And it is because of her incredible stewardship of this property. Sorry, I'm really trying hard to contain this. It means a lot to me because we would not have this in this really great property. We would not have original plants that Elizabeth Lawrence put in the ground with her own hands. Like we would not have that if anyone else had purchased this property. And Lindy was so careful, even being an avid gardener, she was so careful about planting and uncovering things and, and really you know, allowing those original plants to thrive. And she was a very, very careful steward of, of this place. And so we owe Lindy a lot of props and I give her full risk. I could not go into this in the presentation. I so, so wanted to, and thank you whoever asked that question. Thank you so much for asking because, oh my God, there's so much there and um, it's really special. So the Winghaven Foundation actually purchased the property from Lindy in 2008. Lindy, I should say, Lindy sold the property to the foundation. But before she did that, she wanted to make sure that this place was preserved and protected. And so she engaged um, the help of many wonderful, learned people, including Stacy Catron. Thank you, Stacy, for being part of the group called the Friends of Elizabeth Lawrence, who helped Lindy figure out how to preserve this property in perpetuity. And one of the organizations or both, there were two organizations involved in that group, the Friends of Elizabeth Lawrence. One was the Winghaven Foundation and one was the Garden Conservancy. And so the Garden Conservancy actually um, agreed to hold a conservation easement. Lindy donated the money to put up for the conservation easement. And so to this day, and 
going forward forever, there's a conservation easement on this property, thanks to the, that group of people and the work that they did to help Lindy figure out how to preserve this place. And so, yes, so when Lindy sold the property to the Winghaven Foundation in 2008, and then we opened as a public garden in 2009 to early 2010. And um, yeah, so now we are one of the three properties owned um, and operated by the Winghaven Foundation as public garden spaces. So that's, I mean, as, as much of a nutshell as I can put around that, there you go. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. And um, yeah, Lindy Wilson is definitely a hero here at Weehaven. Um, very quickly, Andrea, could you uh, answer Kim's question about uh, volunteer opportunities? Specifically, are there opportunities to volunteer at the Elizabeth Lawrence House and Garden? Oh my gosh, yes. Thank you, yes. <laughs> Um, so yes, I volunteers that that help me out Saturday mornings from 10 to 12. And um, yeah, please, you can go to our website and click on uh, volunteer right from our, our homepage. And we'll get you started on the path to to coming volunteering. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> And also I, couldn't, to I couldn't do this without volunteers, much like, you know, Stacy couldn't do all that she does without having great volunteer help too. Couldn't so, do it. Yeah. <laughs> Our volunteers are everything. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, couldn't agree more. And there are other opportunities uh, to, if you just want to hang around the Elizabeth Lawrence house with our hosts too. So that's, that's a fun opportunity. Um, <clears throat> it appears we have two questions left that you both may want to contribute to. Um, Sharon is asking, would you name a few gardens that Elizabeth did design? Are they mostly in the Middle South or are some still in existence? Mm. Good question. Um, so there, most of her design work was collaborative. She really wanted to work with the, the garden owners, the, the property owners. Um, and, and as her nephew tells me, she wasn't really a great businesswoman. So we don't have like records in that regard of like, hey, I worked on this property and I charged them this. You know, she didn't, she, she just, she loved being asked, what do you think about this? What kind of plants would you put here? How would you do this? And it was always a conversation between um, the, the, the garden owner and Elizabeth. And um, so she would, she would write letters and she would give ideas, but, um, so we don't, we don't have a definitive list of, of gardens that she um, designed or helped design or worked on. We do know that she was uh, a big part of designing um, the country doctors. Um, let's see, how does that, the, the country, let's see, the country doctors museum. I think it's the physic garden of the country doctors museum, sorry, in Bailey, North Carolina although that garden has since been completely redesigned from what I understand. Um, and, and so many of the, the home gardens that we know, the private gardens that we know that she worked on, those have also changed a lot because ownership, you know, goes, you know, from, from person to person. And so, yeah, we're getting to a, you know, to a point where the people with whom she would have collaborated, the, the homeowners, are, are aging out or have aged out. And um, so a lot of those things I'm sure have, have changed. Jill, you're muted. I know, sorry. There's so much background noise in the office here. Uh, Stacy, did you have anything to add to that? No, I think Andrea covered that beautifully. And just to remind everyone, I mean, I know everyone knows this, but gardens are very ephemeral. And um, you know, they change quickly and they change through ownership. And that's back to the earlier um, great statement and explanation that Andrea was giving about Lindy Wilson's role in this property for over 23 years. I mean, really to have the right person in the right place at the right time. I mean, really in, in the example of Lindy is just very unusual. And I mean, beyond remarkable, quite honestly, I've been to hundreds and hundreds of gardens all over the U.S. and also in many other countries. And this story is extremely unique. 
and very precious. And I just, just want to reemphasize, take this moment to reemphasize that, that piece of this story. Um, thank you for that comment, but I don't want to end there because I think this last question is a great way to end this presentation. So those of you in the audience, stick with us. We do have an announcement after um, Andre and Stacy answer this, this last question um, from someone anonymous. Who are the emerging women garden writers we should be following today? I'm sure Lawrence and the other women in this presentation inspired many of them. Oh my gosh, it's such a huge question. That is a huge question, but I, 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 <clears throat> I mean, no disrespect to any, anyone else, but there is one that bubbles up for me um, immediately. So, well, actually there are two. Marta McDowell is one. Um, and it's not just because she, she may still be, she may still be on this, on this webinar, but honestly, like, I, this is why, like, when I started reading one of her books, I, I like told Jill, who's a, our director of outreach and education, that I was like, if future symposium speaker, this gal's great. I love the way she writes. Um, very engaging. And, and just, again, sort of like you're sitting right there talking to her. Another one for me is Marianne Wilburn and um, very smart and uh, very practical knowledge, but also very um, book smart knowledge. Yep, those, those are two that just bubble up right away. I mean, for me, it changes daily to be quite honest because I read, I'm a voracious reader and I read garden poets and I read, you know, practical garden books and I read garden history. So really hard. I agree. Those are two excellent garden writers. I'm just thinking on my mind because of two people I was with yesterday who I think are exceptional garden writers. Um, Jennifer Jewell. Yeah. Um, I think we posted her. You all have posted her. Phenomenal garden writer. She's got two books out. And then a garden writer who's published lots of articles and has a book coming out with Timber Press next year, Abra Lee. And right now I would say um, there are two garden writers that are at the very top of my radar and just think about a lot. Um, but I also look backwards a lot. <laughs> so um, it's my birthday this week. And um, one thing I asked for from my partner was if he might be able to find um, a first edition copy of Vita's book of garden poems, which I'm holding in my hand right now. Well, we'll see. Y'all have to stay tuned for our next collaboration. <laughs> Oh my God. Oh my gosh. But um, so interestingly, um, this precious volume from 1946 that's part of Elizabeth's collection really seems very relevant right now when I read passages here. Um, so that's always looking backwards, but also moving forward at the same time. Yeah. One yeah. foot firmly rooted in the past while looking ahead. Exactly. 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 Yeah. Definitely those women you mentioned are very um, inspiring and, and um, influential today um, as contemporary writers. And I know that the Atlanta History Center offers many uh, programs, um, not just about garden writers, but many, many things. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. But I love that you mentioned Marta McDowell, Marianne Wilburn, Abra Lee, Jennifer Jewell, these are all women and, and presenters and writers that we also hear at Winghaven present through our lecture series, which happens in the winter starting in January. So I can't say it enough. I'd love for all of you out there in the Atlanta community to, um, to connect with us. Um, we're able to do that in today's world. And so we'd love to have you participate in some of our virtual programming. And of course, when you're in Charlotte, do come visit. I want to um, thank both Andrea and Stacy for their research and their uh, their presentation, um, such a wonderful, inspiring presentation about this, um, this woman, Elizabeth Lawrence, internationally celebrated horticulturalist, landscape architect and garden writer, one who has influenced generations of Southern gardeners and gardening. Before we sign off, um, you'll notice on your screen, um, this is the Winghaven Symposium. It's our biennial symposium coming up on November 3rd and 4th. So just around the corner, consider joining Winghaven as we celebrate 50 years 
of the Winghaven Foundation with a special virtual edition of our biennial two-day symposium highlighting our vision to inspire passion for the national, na, excuse me, natural world. Um, on the first day on November 3rd, we have an in-person bird walk around um, Charlotte. Um, we also have four virtual workshops, so any of you can join in on that. And then an in-person evening cocktail celebration. I will say, I will mention one of the workshop facilitators is Marta McDowell doing um, a nod to Elizabeth Lawrence and her book on the little bulbs with a bulb workshop <laughs> virtually. So this you'll wanna see, this you'll wanna do. And she is also one of our keynote speakers. Um, we have two, they're, they're both contemporary write, writers. In addition to Marta McDowell, it's uh, Lyanda Lynn Haupt, who's an eco-philosopher and naturalist and ornithologist. who will be sharing a lot of, from the bird side of Wing Haven. So do um, check that out on our website. You can find out more. Uh, winghavengardens.org about our symposium, our Imbibe and Inspire, our lecture series, how to visit, when to visit, all that stuff is on our website. And then I would like to mention uh, an upcoming event for the Atlanta History Center. Um, we humbly invite you to visit the exhibition, American Democracy, A Great Leap of Faith, which is opening November 6th. So you can do it all, November 3rd, 4th, and 6th. You get a break in the middle at the Atlanta History Center. Um, this particular uh, exhibit, American Democracy, explores the origins, impact, and expansion of the American democratic system. For more information about this event and others, please visit AtlantaHistoryCenter.com. On behalf of Winghaven, many thanks to all of you for zooming in and to the Cherokee Garden Library for hosting this wonderful program. Have a fantastic day, everyone. Thanks, Thank everybody. Great to be with you.